What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, here for the next part in our a little discussion of the Bitcoin DEF mailing list, because this is really one of the most awesome sources of knowledge that we have in Bitcoin, and all of the things that will happen in Bitcoin are going to be discussed in this format. However, it's sometimes a bit, uh, let's say, challenging to read. And uh, I, I definitely don't understand half of what is being said there. But at least we can try to accumulate this knowledge and try to understand. Uh, so therefore, uh, let's get right into it. Today, we really have a jam. And that is something that is going to be a huge part uh, in the coming Schnorr upgrade uh, of Segregated Witness. And this is Taproot, a privacy-preserving, switchable scripting. Uh, and that is awesome here. It is uh, proposed by the uh, ingenious mind of Gregory Maxwell, who is pretty much uh, has, uh, has invented all the cool stuff in Bitcoin. <laughs> and a couple of years later, uh, we will implement it. For example, Gregory Maxwell has also proposed coin drones. Think back in 2012 or 13. And only now do we see like a really good implementation with Wasabi Wallet uh, several years later. Uh, so he has here in 2018, January the 23rd, he has provided here this great new email uh, with an ingenious idea on how we can build something or, or well, how we can use Schnorr signatures in a really cool way uh, with something that he calls Taproot. Uh, so just as we did last time, uh, we are just going to read and kind of like loosely talk about it uh, to try to understand it again. Uh, I'm going to probably make a bunch of mistakes here in this video. So take everything I say with a lot of grain of salt, uh, because this is very complex and we all have to do our best and try to understand it. Right? Okay, let's get into it. Reading now. Interest in Merkleized script pub keys, that is masked, is driven by two main areas, efficiency and privacy. And here again, right? It, this is a trade-off that we don't always have, something that is both efficient and private. Uh, and if, if it then is also cheap to, to integrate and doable, then we really have something special. And I think Taproot is one of these awesome technologies that has a net benefit uh, for pretty much everything. Efficiency, because unexecuted forks of a script can avoid ever hitting the chain. And privacy, because hiding unexecuted code leaves scripts indistinguishable to the extent that their only difference are in the unexecuted parts. And that kind of shows already what might be possible with this. Uh, basically, we can have very complex scripts uh, that are organized in a Merkleized tree structure. And we only have to reveal publicly the, the parts of the scripts that are actually executed, that are actually being used to spend these Bitcoin. Uh, but all the other really complex things that we put into the script can be hidden or hashed uh, in a way that we still commit to it, uh, but nobody knows what we actually have committed to. Uh, so that is really cool. Continuing, as Mark Friedenbach and others have pointed out before, it is almost always the case that interesting scripts have a logical top level branch, which allows satisfaction of the contract with nothing other than signatures by all parties, right? And that, that kind of makes sense, right? Because most of the time, even with the most complex smart contracts, where we have like, I don't know, like five different spending conditions and only after like the, the third full moon of a month has passed or something, we can do crazy stuff with all that. But as long as everyone of the parties involved agrees, why should they not be able to change the entire thing? Right? Why should we not be able uh, to change the contract if everyone agrees and, of course, proves this with a cryptographic signature? And that is exactly what Taproot here tries to solve. So, continuing. Other branches would only be used where some participants is failing to cooperate. More strongly stated, I believe that any contract with a fixed finite participant set up front can be and should be represented as an or between an N of N and whatever more complex contract you might want to represent. Right? Again, it kind of makes sense that even with the most complex, it can be pretty much any contract, uh, either very simple or very complex. As long as all parties agree, 
why would they not be able to change uh, this, right? Because after all, they all agree. Uh, so who's going to stop them, right? Continuing. Uh, one point that comes up while taking about, talking about Merkleized scripts is can we go about making fancier contract use cases as indistinguishable as possible from the most common and boring payments? A great, great little sentence here. And, and this really shows the importance of a anonymity set, right? If you are the only one walking naked in a crowd, everyone is going to look stupidly at you, right? However, if everyone is walking naked, <laughs> then you are indistinguishable from all others. And so you are no longer draw that much attention. And the same is the case here in Bitcoin. If we all have just single signature, one UTXO uh, outputs, and then this, right, this would be the most basic case. However, if then one individual has like a several byte long script with endless, endless different conditions, then it might be the case uh, that we are going to look a bit uh, extra at this, uh, at this transaction. And thus, it's no longer as private as it can be. So the goal of this is to, to achieve that even the most complex scripts looks exactly the same as the most basic single signature scripts. Okay, continuing here. Otherwise, if the anonymity set of a fancy usage is only other fancy usage, it may not be very large in practice. Uh, so what he's, what he's saying here that if we, if we want to have fancy usage and all, like, and we only have the anonymity set of those that have other fancy usages, right? So for example, Alice has like a crazy seven out of 11 multi-signature and Bob has like a crazy five out of seven plus a time lock or something else. Then of course, those two kind of look the same and they kind of maybe fall into the same category. But of course, they are different from all the other single signature uh, UTXOs. And thus, right, the anonymity set has decreased. One suggestion has been that ordinary checksig only scripts should include a dummy branch for the rest of the tree. And that could be just a random value hash, making it look like there are potentially alternative rules when they are not really. Uh, so what we could do in order to increase the anonymity set of these fancy contracts is we can make every quote unquote dumb contract look fancy. And of course we could do that, right? Just adding some random hash. It uh, doesn't really matter what this hash is. We just need to quote unquote fake that there is another condition uh, usable for spending uh, this, um, this script. However, then he continues here, the negative side of this is an additional 32 byte, the value of the hash or the size of this hash, overhead for the overwhelming common case, uh, which does not need it. So if we do that, that we quote unquote fake a new, or that we fake this, uh, these additional uh, conditions to the basic condition, then this means that we have to add this additional hash, which has to be stored on the blockchain by every full node. And thus, it's going to be really costly. And although we might increase in privacy, the cost is a massive trade-off here, right? And that's why it's so difficult to have this net-net win-win uh, for everyone. I think that the privacy gains are worth doing such a thing. But different people reason differently about these trade-offs. Exactly, right? We, privacy is so massively important. And that's what he points out here is that we really, really, really need to make sure uh, that, that we get more privacy into the base layer. And although that, let's say the hardcore cypherpunks, those that really understand the importance of privacy, they are willing to pay extra uh, for these 32 bytes. However, the incentives are not aligned, right? It's cheaper to be less anonymous, to be less private. And when it's cheaper, then most peers are going to do that. Well, because after all, like money is a huge incentive and these Satoshis are precious. And I don't want to spend 32 extra bytes for every single transaction just so that I can increase the anonymity set of those that use fancy smart contracts. So, right, the trade-offs, the incentive models, so, so difficult to get right. Uh, and, and that's why it's tricky software. It turns out, however, that there is no need to make a trade-off. 
That's interesting, right? Uh, when we employ really smart uh, tools and technologies, we might be able to achieve this win-win situation. The special case of a top-level threshold signature or arbitrary conditions can be made indistinguishable from a normal one-party signature with no overhead at all, with a special delegating checksig, which I call taproot. Okay, so first time this word was spoken here into existence, uh, and it's a beauty. So what he's basically saying is that we can use these crazy smart complex uh, contracts and then use a threshold signature, right? That's, uh, that's Schnorr cryptographic metric or some other arbitrary conditions, right? So, so it could be that the top level is a N of N multisig, but it might be something else, right? It does not necessarily have to be the N of N multisig on the top level that actually gets put into the blockchain. And the cool thing is that then this top level looks indistinguishable from any other one-party signature. And that's really cool. So it's the complete sw like switched around. Uh, we no longer try to make dumb contract look smart. We try to make smart contracts look dumb. And that's really cool. So let's say we want to create a coin that can be redeemed by either Ellis and Bob or by a check lock time, or sorry, check sequence verify time lock and Bob. Okay, uh, so either it's the two of two multisig, or it's only Bob's signature, but only after a certain time, right? Uh, so there are many cool use cases for this uh, that that might make this possible. So Alice has the public key A, and Bob has the public key B. Right, that's just how things are. <laughs> we can compute. The two out of two, so N of N, right? Both parties agree. Aggregated key, which then is the key C, which is the both the private key A plus B, as well as the public key A plus B, as well as the uh, signature A plus B. So the cool thing here is with Schnorr aggregation uh, that we can generate a single public key and a corresponding single signature that can only be generated with both the public key of A and B or their signature. Uh, so that's really cool. He continues, simplified to protect against rogue key attacks, you may want to use a MUSIC key aggregation function. And MUSIC is the multi-signature scheme uh, that is developed. I know that Peter Woolley is very much involved. I'm not sure if he's... Uh, I'm not sure exactly who else is, is working on that, but many bright minds are involved here. And that is basically the multi-signature that uses exactly this, right, uh, with the key aggregation uh, so that we can kind of make two keys into one. Uh, and thus, right, this one key can be on the blockchain and no one knows if this key C is just the key of Charlie or if it is actually the aggregated key of Alice and Bob, which is awesome. We form our time lock script S, which would be then the timeout, how, whichever how many blocks we want to have, the op check sequence verify, op drop uh, in order to get this off the stack, then B's public key, and we want to check if the signature is actually corresponding to this public key. Uh, and this is the second condition of our branch, right? It's here the check sequence verify plus Bob's signature. Now we can tweak C to produce P, which is the key we'll publish. And that is the P, public key, is the C plus the hash of the C times the signature of the generator point. Okay, so this right here is some Schnorr cryptographic magic, uh, which definitely I don't exactly how to even pronounce this correctly. But basically, what we're doing here is we're going to tweak a signature. Uh, so that is exactly what here this aggregation step is. Uh, we're going to tweak signatures A and B in order to get C. Uh, and that's just the, the fancy mathematical way of, of putting this out there. Uh, so we're going to produce here this P, the, the public key. This is the attack hardened pay to contract construction as described in uh, two. And here we see two is uh, side chains, um, a really cool feature, or Appendix A. Um, I mean, there was the federated side chains model uh, here that Blockstream uses in their liquid side chain. 
Uh, and I'm not exactly sure here what this Appendix A says. We uh, well, might look at this later. Okay. And the attack harden, that's something that I, I, I also have not yet understand uh, or understood. But I think, uh, and again, the speculation, uh, not that smart, is that this means that the C cannot, or when you only have C, you cannot tell the difference uh, between A or B or C. So you don't know if this is the single key of Charlie or the aggregated key of Alice and Bob. Uh, but again, that's, that's much more speculation. <laughs> Um, okay, then we pay to a script public key of the taproot supporting version of the elliptical curve point P. Uh, so, so that is really cool, right? We, we're going to pay to this, to this public key script, basically, uh, that, that is all these conditions uh, that we put in here. And that is just a regular pay to, uh, pay to script pub key. Hash, right? It's you pay to what looks like to be a single signature key, uh, which is awesome. Uh, so there's no difference here, and it's not really then a, uh, a pay to script hash or something. It actually is a public key. Now we have Alice and Bob, assuming they are both online and agree about the resolution of their contract, and they can jointly form a two of two signature for P and spend as if they were a payment to a single party. One of them just needs to add the hash of C and S to their private key. So, okay, a long sentence, a lot packing in here. Like You can unpack Gregory's, uh, Gregory's sentences really word by word, and you're, we're going to take like an hour to get through this. <laughs> So uh, what he says here is that assuming both are online, so one of the quote-unquote drawbacks is that Taproot, as far as I know, is an interactive protocol. So Alice and Bob need to communicate for a couple rounds uh, before they can publish the complete signature to the blockchain. Uh, so if only Alice is online and Bob is not online, or well, offline, then Alice can not alone uh, spend this uh, script or spend the UTXO. So thus, both have to be online, and uh, that's well, somewhat of a maybe drawback, but I mean, after all, if you want to spend money together, you kind of have to communicate, right? So I think it's, it's justifiable. And they both, again, uh, can form the two out of two signature, uh, which is here C, right? That is A plus B. Uh, and then they can thus form P, right? So P is the C plus the hash of C over S times G. Uh, so they can both uh, create here this uh, the signature corresponding to the public key here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. And it looks like a single party, right? We don't know if P here uh, has been done by Charlie or by Ellis and Bob both together. Okay, I'll continue. Alternatively, the taproot consensus rules would allow this script to be satisfied by someone who provides the network with C, which is the, orig the original committed public key, S, uh, which is the signature, and does what, or, or sorry, the script, uh, and does whatever the script requires. For example, passes the check sequence verified check and provides Bob's signature. With this information, the network can verify that C plus H plus the hash of um, C and S equals P. Uh, so again, right, this, uh, this is awesome because now we can say that if we publish C, uh, which is here the aggregation of A plus B, uh, then we can get the script uh, which here, right here, the time, uh, the time out and check sequence verify with only uh, Bob's signature right here. And we can then, or everyone can prove that this actually committed to being P. And because P is known to the blockchain, right, uh, we can then be sure that this actually works and that this actually is the spending condition which both Alice and Bob have committed when they have published P uh, in the funding of the script. Okay, so in the all signed cases, there is zero overhead, right? You only have to publish your C and the signature for that. 
you don't uh, you, you do neither have to publish anything with a or b and nothing with s right uh, so the, this entire second condition can be completely forgotten doesn't matter because we have actually here uh, c and no one can tell that the contract alternative exists right it's hashed it's just a random number uh, and we don't even we don't even publish it in the alternative redemption branch, the only overhead is revealing the original combined pub key. And of course, the existence of the contract is made public. Uh, so this then means if Alice and Bob do not provide their signature as here the first case has been, but actually Bob does with the check, lock or check sequence verify, then of course the entire network is going to know that there has been this uh, that there is the second condition, right? The network has to know because everyone has to validate it. Uh, and we also know, though, that Alice and Bob have committed to this script uh, because we know P and we can prove that the script is part of calculating P, which is awesome. But again, then, if and only if we use the second condition, then we actually publish and quote unquote lose some of the privacy. This composes just fine with whatever other Merkle script system we might care to use, as the S can be whatever kind of data we want, including the root of some tree. Th that is just mind blowing. What this S condition is, right? It doesn't matter. It really does not matter because we hash it anyhow, right? Uh, and then we hash this and add it to C in order to get P. Thus, what is inside this hash does not matter. It can be only one line like this here. It could be a massive script with many, many different operators. Or, as Gregory points out here, it could be the root of another Merkleized tree. So we could commit to the root of a tree that then commits to hundreds of other scripts. And we can verify this just by revealing one branch of this Merkle root, or sorry, of this Merkle tree. So we can have endlessly, literally endlessly complex uh, scripts that we can commit to, but we only need to reveal whichever script we actually end up using. That is insane, it's, it's so mind blowing. My example shows that two out of two but it would work for the same amount for any number of participants. And with the setup interaction, any threshold of participant, so long as you don't mind the inability to tell which member signed off. So this is really cool. Um, here with, with the Schnorr aggregated multi-signature, uh, right here. Uh, this is not as the elliptical curve multi-signature as we have it now, right? That you actually have to publish um, let's say here in this case, two public keys and two signatures. Because we can aggregate these keys, uh, we can have A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F and so on, like 20 different keys. And we can aggregate them all to be the same C, right? It's only one public key and only one signature. But the signature can only be well, computed if we have the signatures of all the participants, like even if it's 20 different participants, as long as they all provide the valid signature, only then can we compute the aggregated key and signature. And thus we can have many, many, many different participants. The verification of computational complexity of signature path is obviously the same as any other plain signature since it's indistinguishable. Again, right, this is the massive, massive efficiency gain. Because it's the key aggregation, all we do is verify one signature. And the, the heavy part in the computation is done by the signers at the point in time where it's actually being signed. So that is awesome, right? We, we can have like hundreds of keys that make up this one signature. And these hundred peers might have taken a long, long time in order to generate the signature. But to verify it, it's exactly the same as any other single signature is. Thus, the efficiency gains here are massive on the verification side. 
verification of the breach or sorry of the branch redemption requires a hash and a multiplication with a constant point which is strictly more efficient than a signature verification and could be efficiently fused into a batch signature validation. Um, so again, so much in this one sentence, it's insane. <laughs> verification of this bra uh, branch. So uh, we, we can easily prove that the signature is correct. And for this, all we need here uh, is this constant point um, provided. Not exactly sure which this is, but this means that we can also batch the signature validation. So now if we have different non-aggregated keys, uh, so let's, let's assume we have the aggregated key C and we have another aggregated key D and E and F and so on. So all of these C, D, E, F keys are different keys. They are not aggregated. So unique keys, unique signatures. However, with Schnorr signature, because we have this constant point, we can batch the verification of these signatures. And thus it's going to be much easier and much, or not easier, but much faster and more efficient and less resource intensive in order to verify all of these signatures, which is again, very neat. We're actually gonna increase efficiency here as well. Okay, almost done. Two more paragraphs, but that is in, in GMAX terms, like entire book in and of itself. <laughs> The nearest competitor to this idea that I can come up with would support would supporting a simple delegation where the output can be spent by the named key or a spending transaction that could provide a script along with the signature of that script by the named key delegating control to the signed script. That was a mouthful. Um, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure, certain how this would work, uh, but basically there, there would be some delegation here uh, where we can, hmm. <laughs> I, I would have to read that sentence like three more times in order to make something sensible out of this. Um, delegating control to the signed script. Let's read that again, <laughs> because I think this will actually help you as well. So the nearest competitor uh, to this idea that I can come up would be supporting a simple delegation where the output can be spent. Uh, so of course, the coin can be spent by the named key, uh, which would be C, right, which we have to, we, which we have committed to, or a spending transaction could provide a script along with a signature of that script by the named key. Okay, now I get it. So we can either spend the script here by providing the valid uh, signature of C, or we can, uh, we can sign this entire script S with the key of C, right? So both Alice and Bob have to provide individual signatures above S, and then they can aggregate it so that they have the signature C, which is committed in the blockchain, that signs this new script. So this other alternative that GMAX here is proposing would be that we only publish C, and at that point, not yet S, okay? And then at a later point in time, right, even after the transaction has been proposed to the blockchain, then Alice and Bob can, uh, can generate here uh, or build up this script, and if then both of them sign this script, uh, then they prove right that they are in accordance or that, that they agree to the script as spending uh, conditions. Of course, the negative drawback would be that they do not commit to the script uh, at the time of, of, of sending the Bitcoin to this, uh, to this key C. Uh, so this would mean that they can easily add conditions after the fact, but this would mean that they are not necessarily committing to a certain script. And depending on the use case, uh, this might actually be very useful. Uh, so I guess a combination of both would be cool. And by the way, that is Graftroot, uh, which we're going to read about uh, in one of these next uh, videos. Okay, continuing here. Before paying into that escrow, Alice and Bob would construct this signature, 
This idea is equally efficient in the common case, but larger and slower to verify in the alternative spend case. Uh, so what he's saying here is that this idea would be exactly the same if they only use C right here. So if they both agree uh, to just spend with their single signature, then perfect, everything is fast. It is just as fast as taproot. However, when we have here, uh, or when they want to then after the fact, uh, sign this uh, or, or uh, commit to this script, then the verification part is more expensive, more resource intensive, because you also have to prove the sign or verify the signature uh, of C over S. Uh, so according to GMAX, that is more uh, resource intensive. This idea, oh no, oh, yeah, that's what we just read. Okay, setting up the signature requires additional interaction between the participants and the resulting signature must be durably stored and could not just be recomputed using a single party information. Yeah, yeah great, great what he points out here. Uh, so again, right, if Alice and Bob want to sign S, then both of them have to actually do something uh, because they can only get a valid signature of C across S if both A and B have signed. Uh, so first A needs to sign this, then she needs to send the sign package to B, and then B has to sign it, uh, and then they can compute C out of this. But this is a, a several step computation and uh, thus they actually really need to yeah, be online and interactive. And as well, this entire script needs to be stored. It's not in the blockchain, right? It, and not even a hash is in the blockchain. Uh, so you really have to be extra certain uh, to have good backups, not just of the private keys that are used for A, B and no, just for A and B, uh, but also the entire script and and with that like the real public key so the uh, uh like the, the real actually written out script and not the hash or, or the binary version so. and again right uh, anything that must be stored on your site individually is a potential uh, security hole if you lose that information but same would be with any other uh, bitcoin private key or script I believe that this construction will allow the largest possible anonymity set for fixed party smart contracts by making them look like the simplest possible payments. Awesome, right? So we can have a huge anonymity set because even the most complex uh, smart contracts with even like a hundred different individuals in the, or in the spending conditions all they put into the blockchain, all they commit to upfront is the single public key of C. And whatever, uh, whatever other keys have, you, have been used to aggregate uh, to this key C and whichever script uh, conditions or Merkle tree of scripts uh, is here hashed with um, C does not really matter, right? All that is in there is P and that's it. Uh, so, so that is that is outstanding, right? Uh, so it's it's a huge anonymity set uh, because everything looks like the most dumb, most most simple, most basic possible spending condition. But what is hidden behind that spending condition can be as elaborate and complex as you can imagine, which is awesome. It accomplishes this without any overhead in the common case, if everyone agrees, which is most likely uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of times. There is not one single extra bit that we need to put into the blockchain and that we need to validate. It's the exact same as if only one individual would use his single one private key uh, to sign uh, a UTXO. And invoking any sketchy or impractical techniques requiring extra rounds of interaction between contract parties and without requiring the durable storage of other data. So invoking any sketchy or, or impractical techniques um, means that it's, it's not really a hack, right? It's, it's not really some convoluted thing. It's actually quite simple, right? You aggregate the N of N uh, key, and then you, you sign or you, or you hash here, you commit to a script uh, together with this key. 
and whatever that script is, is is up to you so it's it's very very simple actually right it's it's like it's almost nothing but because it's so simple so quote unquote trivial that's why why we can build a lot of complexity on top right we can use stupid tools in order to build something beautiful uh, but probably not the other way around um, it does not require any extra rounds of interaction between contract participants. And I think, uh, although I'm not sure that we do need uh, several rounds of interaction in order to compute C, but then, uh, and maybe even S, but then once we have committed P to the blockchain, uh, Bob can spend this condition here uh, oh, sorry, here, this condition, the check sequence verify time block. And so Bob can spend S uh, without any interaction of A. So A cannot get in the way of Bob uh, when he has a valid solution to the script that Alice agreed upon previously, right? So Alice has agreed to a voluntary contract, which is the Bitcoin script. And thus Bob can use it uh, even though Alice might no longer agree to it after the fact. But, well, bad luck. When you've agreed to a private contract, you have to uphold it, right? And thus, Alice, or Alice can not censor Bob for his rightful use of these Bitcoin, uh, which is awesome. And then without requiring durable storage of other data. Uh, so, again, I do believe that they need to store here this signature, or sorry, the script, um, the exact conditions. Uh, and of course the private keys, right? That these need to be stored. Uh, but because they are committed to here in P on the blockchain, uh, they don't necessarily, or, well, hmm. I'm not exactly certain here where the, where, the, where the improvements are in regards to storing of this. Because as I said, you, you need to store as a minimum uh, the keys of A and B and the script. Uh, but I guess that's the minimum viable thing, right? I mean, you, you need to store the contracts that you use in any case, right? You need to prove that this was actually the contract. And because like even in, in today's Bitcoin, like, I don't think that anyone is, is using like direct scripts into the, into the blockchain. Um, I, like, I'm, I'm very sure that all the, the script contracts are actually pay to script hashes. Uh, so you hash this uh, script and then you publish the hash on the blockchain. Uh, so thus, you need to have the script itself in order to recompute again uh, this hash and prove that this is actually what you have committed to. Uh, so actually, yeah, like, there are no many, not many additional storage requirements here, here in that sense. Yeah, and uh, that, that was it. Um, that's one email. Like probably like two pages <laughs> and like as i said we can we can probably like write a book just about what what gregory has written here uh, really really smart really like ingenious and i think because it is rather simple it's somewhat intuitive like don't get me wrong this is cutting edge financial technology and cryptography and like probably like not too many people need to know about this, but you having this knowledge and somewhat understanding it, even the most basics and the very high level is very value, valuable. Uh, so Gregory here also links, oh, perfect, here are all the names, that's great, uh, to a paper published here in 2018, uh, Simple Schnorr Multi-Signatures with Applications to Bitcoin. Awesome. And this is a great paper that I very much encourage you to read because Schnorr signatures are awesome. That's the music paper. Uh, so that was written by Gregory Maxwell, Andrew Polstra, Yannick Soirin, and Peter Woolley. Uh, so this is really, really good. Um, really worth checking out. And, and music is a beautiful, beautiful uh, paper and an awesome technology. I'm so glad that we have these smart peers working on this stuff because I'm definitely not smart enough. <laughs> and then here we also have uh, the uh, Blockstream paper on federated sidechains called Enabling Blockchain Innovations with Packed Sidechains. And we have again like a rock star team here of Adam Back, Matt Carollo, Luke Dash Jr., Mark Friedenbach, Gregory Maxwell, Andrew Miller, Andrew Paulstra, uh, George Timon, and Peter Woolley. Uh, so this was written in 2014. 
I mean, isn't that insane? Like we have all this research in 2014, but then we actually implement it quote unquote only in late 2018 with the liquid network. Uh, so we need like what, four years uh, to get from theory to implementation to actually a live mainnet usage. Uh, so although this paper is somewhat, or sorry, this email here is somewhat old, written in uh, early 2018, we are just yet somewhat contemplating on how we can implement it. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is very new, very cutting edge technology. And I, I hope this, this video was somewhat of value because Taproot, I think, is going to be this massive improvement uh, to Bitcoin scripting uh, and especially Graftroot, uh, which we will read in one of these next videos. Uh, Pierce, I, I hope this was a value to me, uh, to you, <laughs> because it was a value to me. It actually really was. Uh, I've, I've understood Taproot now after reading this and contemplating this out aloud and actually like, manifesting my thoughts about it uh, into the uh, spoken word uh, really helps me out a lot. So uh, also thank you, right, for, for all the donations here on, on Telecoin. I really, really appreciate it. And please also like say thank you to Gregory Maxwell, to Peter Woolley, Adam Back, and all the other geniuses working here on this, uh, because you and I probably, well, of course, like we could uh, work this out ourselves. But I'm really glad that we do not have to invent this, uh, invent this because damn, it's so complex. I've, yeah, it's. I'm really glad that we have these smart minds working on our side for freedom and not uh, for the tyranny <laughs> uh, because they uh, would be very good at that. Well, but good that they are actually on the good side of fighting for the right cause and here making Bitcoin as usable as it possibly can. Piers, thank you very much here for, for digging down this rabbit hole with me together. And please leave your comments in the chat uh, and, and your experience here and, and where you can think you can use uh, this taproot and, and what else uh, you can build with this awesome tech. Thank you very much and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.